the overall goal of my research is to understand how early terrestrial ecosystems um, first assembled and what was their impact on, on key earth systems. As we've already heard, there's a growing body of, of evidence to suggest that uh, these early systems rep, uh, resembled modern cryptogamic ground covers. And you can see a picture of one on the screen. Cryptogamic ground covers are communities of small plants. They include things like <coughs> lichens as well, uh, cyanobacteria, fungi, algae, one sort or another. Arthropods are a common element. Um, these are actually very widespread and diverse nowadays. They exist in a wide range of environments, ranging from desert environments, namid desert lichen fields, for example, boreal forests are dripping with mosses, and even in, in the Arctic environment, on the Antarctic Peninsula, where you don't get permanent ice fields forming, um, you'll find cryptogamic ground cover. So they're an important part of the, the, um, the modern flora today. Um, so what I intend to do <coughs> over the next half an hour or so is to give you, for those of you who are not familiar with the fossil record, to give you some background into um, some of the strengths and weaknesses of the record. It's important <coughs> to realise that um, one cannot re read the geological record or take it at face value. It's quite, it needs some, quite, some thought and, and, and sophisticated analysis. Uh, <coughs> secondly, what I want to do is talk a little bit or advocate um, the studying of um, model systems. And by this I mean a model, model ecosystem, which is um, in, in this, the one I'm going to be talking about, a system that's exceptionally well preserved. Because under those circumstances, that's where you can actually see how organisms interact. And I'm going to be asking the question there, um, does what we see in this model system actually stand up in terms of interpreting it as a cryptogamic ground cover early on. So what can we see in the, in the early fossil record? Does it substantiate this model of cryptogamic ground cover? And finally, talk a little bit about work project that we're kind of, it's in its beginning at early stages, and it's, um, it's about understanding how these things affect the rocks that they grow on. As we've already heard, they, they actually extract minerals and things from the rocks. So they leave imprints, um, fingerprints, if you like, on the rocks that they live on, physical and chemical. So can we find and characterize these different types of covers based on their chemist chemical imprints of the rocks? And can, that, can we discover then in the fossil record these things and learn a little bit about how these organisms interacted in the past? So first of all, um, where do these things fit in phylogenetically? And of course, we've, uh, where do the early fossils fit in phylogenetically? I just want to summarize that um, briefly with this slide. Um, taken from a paper by Bowman in Current Biology published a couple of years ago, which just outlines what we know um, and what we don't know, perhaps, about uh, the phylogenetic relationships amongst um, the major groups of plants. Um, maybe I can stand in front and point. <coughs> um, I'm a bit worried about doing this with Sean and, uh, and Simon in the, in the room, but there we go. Um, this depicts uh, these, the streptophyte um, clade, land plants monophyletic group, sitting within the, uh, the chorophytes. Um, liverworts paraphyletic to a monophyletic vascular plant. Now, um, we know that this is um, not the complete truth by any means, um, but I, the important bit here is that we're, we are uncertain about relationships amongst the major clades of bryophytes and where vascular plants fit in. That's important for us, and it's really, uh, really important to help us interpret the fossil record that we have a clear answer to that issue here. Now, at the moment, we think that Zygnematales are sister group to, to land plants. So the fossils, where do they fit in? Well, basically, the fossils, most of the fossils fit in this clade here, the vascular plants up there. So um, one of the, the big things we know about the fossil record when we look at it is there's a large taxonomic bias. So we need to bear that in mind. A lot of things are actually missing. Um, so we're missing a lot of the stuff to do with the bryophytes. And um, we don't know, we know virtually nothing about um, the stem group of the, of, the vascular plant, of the land plants and how they evolved from the fossil record. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is that the, the Carophycine <coughs> algae are a pretty diverse group, but by and large, um, a lot of them are, are pretty small organisms um, that are unlikely to preserve well in the fossil record. That said, there's no reason in principle why, given the right environment, one shouldn't find um, groups related to the Carophycine algae. The other interesting thing about it is that they're freshwater, predominantly freshwater, which has led to this idea that, that land plants are, um, <coughs> arose from uh, freshwater algal lineages. Although recently, Harholt et al. in a paper published in Trends in Plant Sciences have, <coughs> uh, re, have, um, 
have raised again, if you like, the, the idea that's, that Stebbins and Hill, I think it was, in the 1980s put forward that the Carafias and algae were in fact originally terrestrial organisms and that nowadays they're secondarily aquatic. And the reason they bring that up again is because they've noticed some similarities between um, the cell wall of uh, polysaccharides and the cell wall of carophytes and, and those of land plants. The truth, I would say, probably lies somewhere in between. So where does this all happen um, in the fossil record? As Tim has already outlined, we're back in the, in the early Paleozoic. That's where the action's going on. Uh, so bottom of the Cambrian here, 600 million or 540 million or so up through to the Devonian period. Just to orientate yourself here, that's when the Cambrian explosion happens. And I would, uh, if you look at the fossil record, the same sort of thing looks like it happens on land during the Devonian period. So there's this big explosion, apparently, apparent explosion of diversity of life plants during the Devonian period. But that's based on a, on, a, on a particular reading of the fossil record. And we know that things are not anywhere near as straightforward as that. For example, we reviewed the evidence a few years ago in a paper published in Bill Trans. And <coughs> the... Uh, <sighs> We looked at the arthropods and, and, and plants, and you can see that the, the plant, plant macrofossil here is plotting the stratigraphic range of when these major groups first, first show up, um, are in the, the Devonian period. But there's a, a fossil record of spores that's already been alluded to that goes way, way back, or much further back indeed. And these are, spores are called cryptospores because we've had real trouble trying to figure out what group of plants actually make them. Well, we're pretty sure that they're, they're made from plant. They're, they're produced by plants. Cryptospores go back to the, the middle Ordovician uncontroversially, but pos some people would argue into the Cambrian. And in fact, they extend, their stratigraphic range extends up here. So you've got all sorts of weird morph morphologies, dyads, tetrads, monads of one sort, sort or another. And then when you throw in the, the calibrated phylogenetic trees, everything gets pushed, seems to get pushed back much further indeed than that. So what, is, what are the reasons for these discrepancies? The one I just want to bring to your attention here, um, because this is about the fossil record, is, um, is the nature of the rock record, which is well, during this period of time, which is well um, explained in this, in this diagram produced by Smith and McGowan in 2007. What they did was they, for the, 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 the geological record, the Phanerozoic, they plotted sedimentary rock outcrop <coughs> area against geological time. This is based on an analysis of 1,200 geological maps from Western Europe. And they plotted the uh, blue sediment is marine, what they were able to interpret as marine, red, um, terrestrial, and white here, they couldn't determine. So what you can see from this diagram, without going into the details, it is basically a tailing off in terms of rock outcrop area across the Phanerozoic, so you get less rock in the early part of the period. But interestingly, from our point of view, here you get a, <coughs> an emergence, a, a start an emergence of, of Devonian sediment, uh, terrestrial sediments becoming, becoming widespread in this Silu end of the Silurian, early part of the Devonian, whereas there's a dearth of terrestrial sediments. Um, going further back from that. So that's part of the explanation behind this um, pattern that we see here. The terrestrial sediments show up and you see the, the macrofossil remains. You can see the, the spores in the marine sediments down here um, because they blow off land and into the marine environment. So the basic point I want to make here is that the, one needs to take a careful look at the nature of the rock record when one is looking at the fossil record, and that's very important. Very important indeed. So what about these cryptospores? Um, what organisms produce the cryptospores? Di it's been difficult because of the marine nature of a lot of these, these sediments. But the answer is produced by our, or has been found out by our host here, um, Diane Edwards, in a lot of the work that she's been doing over the past few years, looking at, um, at, at tiny fossils that show up in this part of the stratigraphic column in the Devonian, where we see the terrestrial sediments. Um, which contain spores of this sort. So um, this is work that Diane, Diane has done. But it just shows the nature of the fossils themselves. These are tiny millimeter size uh, organisms. They're preserved in charcoal. So this is some of the very earliest evidence of charcoal that, that Tim was talking about. We've got to have enough oxygen in the atmosphere to burn these things. 
Um, they contain the dyads and tetrad spores. They also have things like stomates. And so some of these um, resemble superficially the, the capsules of, of, of modern mosses. Of course, they differ in a number of key features. Some of them are vascular, of course, which mosses, moss sporophytes aren't, and they've they got bifurcating sporophytes. So these are moss-like in some of their morphology, but they're not actually mosses themselves. Since I raised the issue of the, <coughs> of the spores, why don't we see spores? How do you explain this, spore di this peculiar spore diversity that we don't see today? And a, in a recent paper, um, we've uh, kind of taken an idea that was originally proposed by Hemsley and, and kind of uh, explained, come up with a mechanistic explanation for, for this level of spore diversity. So this is, a ma this is the meiotic cell division process here. This is what our modern plants go through. And this is hypothetically what, how, how, the, how the, the process might be altered in, in order to form, for example, dyads. So by separating <coughs> in meiosis one, two of those spore lines, you can produce a dyad. By shifting when sporopollenin is actually deposited during this process, you can come up with tetrad-type configurations and so forth. So there is a, a fairly well understood, I would say, mechanistic explanation for how these spores form. Ecologically, we don't know why they were there. What, what they, how they, what, why they functioned in the way they did, and why they actually ultimately went extinct, although we speculate on some, some ideas in, in that paper. Where do these things fit in phylogenetically? <clears throat> and this is again, this is where the, the, the land plant phylogeny becomes really critical. So what we've taken here is a sort of backbone phylogeny based on molecular data, and plotted where we think some of these early organisms fall. Um, it's very difficult with plants of this sort because they're very fragmentary, so we don't have a lot of information about them in order to place them on the phylogenetic tree. But such as we've been able to place seem to fall within the, <coughs> the, the vascular plant stem group, but the others may, may well fall into a sort of big grade of organisms that could fit anywhere in the bottom of this, of this tree of plants. So in order for us to interpret these fossils and what they might mean evolutionarily for, for modern plants, we really need to know more about or better have a better idea of, of, of this topology here. Okay, so this is where um, I want to move to um, model system and talk a little bit about, about the Rhiney chert. So, and um, this is where we're going to be thinking a little bit more about cryptogamic ground colors. So, uh, Rhiney chert, where does it fit in? Well, it fits in before we get forest ecosystems. So, we have forest ecosystems in the middle of the Bonium, but it's a long way before we think um, after life on land, we think, started to really get going in the middle of the Nevertheless, it sits in this cryptogam ground cover window. Um, the Rhiney Church, just to, just to remind you, those of you who don't know, um, is a uh, deposit from, for, from, from Scotland, and this mottled appearance shows the, the, the nature of the plants. So they're preserved in situ, so they, the plants are, the, the great thing about it is you've got complete soft tissue preservation, and you've got thing, all, everything preserved in situ. I'm going to script through, uh, through these slides pretty quickly, because we don't have much time. Um, Rhiney Church's not actually exposed now, but there's an awful lot of material available to study in museum collections, particularly in London and in, in Glasgow. Um, the environment is interpreted as a center system, a little bit like this one in, in Iceland. So plants would have been growing close to the outwash of a, of a hot spring, temperature falls, silica starts to precipitate and petrify the plants. So as a model system, it isn't perfect because it's, it's representing a geothermal wetland rather than just your... Um, kind of normal out there environment. Um, Rhiney Church plants are <coughs> interesting for what they tell us about, um, about the organism, the environment itself, but also um, how they help us interpret uh, fossil plants from other sites because they're so completely preserved. So obviously these things don't have, have leaves and, and proper rooting systems, but these are basal vascular plants with rhizoid-like -like rooting systems. Uh, one of the, 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 the findings that's been most, uh, most interesting fairly recently is the, the finding of life cycles which are essentially isomorphic. It's a new life cycle variant in plants, isomorphic and dioecious. And these, uh, the gametophytes are um, very similar structurally and anatomically to the sporophytes. And this level of de detail where we actually can see the, the uh, sexual organs preserved completely 
um, is very helpful in interpreting other forms of, 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 of fossil, compression fossil at other sites. So this is one here where, for example, we have these peculiar disc-shaped structures which we know in the Rhiney Church bear, bear the, uh, the Archegonium and Anthridia, which you can see similar structures here. <coughs> so one of the questions there is how far do these isomorphic life cycles go up the vascular plant's stem group? Do they go into the base of the lycopods and the euphilophytes? Um, and the answer we is we don't yet know, but maybe there are some sort of vestigial, stru vestigial structures we see in modern groups like Lycopodiaceae that are perhaps indicators that these things did stretch further up into the vascular plants. Um, the other thing about it is what we tell is what it tells us about um, relationships amongst organisms. So um, <coughs> the Rhiney chirp provides good evidence for mycorrhizal associations, first published by Ramey et al. in 1994. But um, uh, these relations um, involving glomeromycodes have been recognized in quite a number of the plants there now. Um, of course, these plants are rootless, so um, the mycorrhizae actually form in the, in the, in the, in the basal regions, but also extend into the, into the upper regions of the plant. Um, and you can see zone, in zones of tissue like that. So in, these, in this respect, in these basal vascular plants, the mycorrhizal-like associations were more like those in modern liverworts, perhaps, mm -hmm. than they are in modern, in modern vascular plants. So a new group um, <coughs> of uh, mycorrhizal fungi has recently come to our attention. It's the mycorrhizina, which have now been shown to be present and forming mycorrhizal-like relations in modern liverworts, hornworts, lycopods, and ferns. And uh, Christine and, and I and others have recently described um, mycorrhizina type fossil um, mycorrhizal relationships in the fossil plant Hornia phytum from the Rhiney Church. So the message here is that mycorrhizal relations, symbiotic relations, are already very diverse um, in this early land environment. Um, so what, we've got fungi forming relations with the plants, fungi also form relationships with cyanobacteria. So uh, the Rhiney Church contains some of the earliest evidence of lichens, for example, and here's one that was described by by Taylor et al. in Nature in 1995. Um, so we've got lichen-like relationships, fungi forming relations with cyanobacteria and plants. Do we have evidence of cyanobacteria <coughs> forming relationships with plants, as they do in things like the hornworts nowadays or basal liverworts like, like Blasia? And the answer is, well, possibly. So um, Krings et al. fairly recently, 2009, published what they interpreted as a sign of bacterial symbiosis in, um, in the fossil plant Aglophyton, where the cyanobacterial filaments are, come in through the stomates and, um, and work their way through intercellular spaces. So a little bit analogous to what one might see, for example, in modern roots of modern gunnera or, um, or cycas, um, but rather unlike the sort of association that you'd see today in Amphoceros, Hornwood. So, just to summarize that, to that point, um, modern analogs. So how does, this, how does the Rhiney Church stand up in terms of um, interpreting as a cryptogam ground cover? Not bad, actually, I'd say. Um, the plants are small herba and herbaceous. You've got the mostly vascular plants, but they don't have proper rooting systems. They have rhizoid-based rooting systems. There are mycorrhizal associations, which you know are important in many cryptogam ground covers nowadays. Diverse fungal saprotrophs, cyanobacteria, lichen-like associations, oomycetes, plenty of arthropods and nematodes. Uh, so those are the plus points. Um, there are many things in the environments that are of the, of the Rhiney Chert that you wouldn't find today. So there are things like prototaxitis, which we haven't had time, time to talk about, which would be this peculiar fungal or perhaps large lichen-like organism. Um, the the lichen-like associations involve different groups of fungi and, and cyanobacteria. Um, although we have arthropods in there, the columbolans, the mites, and the nematodes, for example, would have probably been good at turning nutrients over, but we don't have annelids and we don't have ants, which are very important components mm -hmm. in some modern cryptogam ground covers. Also, <coughs> it's possible that um, the carbon cycle was slightly different here too, in terms of lignin decomposition. So there's a big question about whether lignin peroxidases were around 
at the basal part of the Devonian system and operating it. So could, how could wood have been decomposed or wood, 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 wood like tissues? So there's a, quest, there's a question around that. And of course, um, we're, we're, we're looking at a world where we're operating in much higher CO2 atmospheres. So um, that's another, another different difference. So one of the things that we'd, we'd like to do is to look at um, modern um, cryptogamic ground covers from the point of view of trying to characterize what the soil ecosystems look like, what the interactions with the minerals actually look like, um, in order to make better comparisons with early fossil systems like this. So one of the places we've chosen to start working is in Iceland. Um, why have we chosen Iceland? Well, in Iceland you've got um, <coughs> terrestrial surfaces of known age. You've got lava fields. You know when they came down. You know how long they've been colonized by plants. So that's a good starting point. You have glacial moraines in front of retreating glaciers. So you know how long that, that ground's been exposed. You've got geothermal wetlands. So there's plenty of opportunity. It's perhaps a little bit cold and windy. Um, but uh, uh, they've also, you've also got a, a rich um, a cryptogamic ground cover. So one of the first things we'd like to say, I think, is that um, in, in considering which cryptogamic ground cover type compositions um, are best good analogs, um, probably the moss type system is not great. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. Um, firstly, mosses are forming kind of peat-like or hummocky um, uh, forms uh, and, and their growth form is rather uh, dissimilar to that uh, that we find in, in the Rhiney chirp plants. So in a moss, typical moss, um, mat forming moss, you've got a growing profile that grows upwards like that, <laughs> leaving kind of decaying or di dead parts behind. And all of this mineral matter that you've got in here, most of the mineral matter you see in the profile is aeolian, so it's coming in from the wind. So you've got this combination of, of an upward growing profile with um, a large mineral component that's coming in not from the ground. These things are not coming out of the ground. It's coming, it's being blown in from the wind. So how this stuff weathers is actually quite an interesting question. Um, and when you see, when you look at the Rhine, uh, sections of Rhiney Turk material, you don't see any of this sort of intercalated a aeolian born, born mineral. Um, the other thing about mosses, of course, is they don't have um, mycorrhizal symbionts. And um, as far as we know, they're not present until the Carboniferous period, although there are examples of controversial mosses that have been described earlier on. So we would rather like to, to do comparisons, I think, with lichen-like or um, liverwort-like covers as a starting point. And um, <coughs> one approach we've been taking is to use micro-CT to try and characterize the soil fabrics. Uh, so here, for example, you see uh, three different three different soil types. This is the moss, the moss type soil, which develops, which rapidly develops a fairly a fairly deep uh, a deep profile. Soils that are covered by um, liverworts and lichens tend to be much thinner, and um, they are bound together or aggregated in a slightly different way. There's lots of uh, cyanobacteria, lots of f fungi involved, and um, extracellular polysaccharides excreted that kind of glue this stuff into a sort of into a sort of crust. So they're much more like your classical biological soil crust than this thing, which is a developing uh, peaty a peaty soil. The, un the neat thing about the micro CT is it enables us to locate mineral grains in precise uh, position with the, with the thing that's growing on top. So the other thing that we really try to get at here is what are the biotic interactions with the mineral grains. And here we do see physical, we're beginning to see physical and we think chemical signals coming out of um, underneath the, the cryptogamic ground cover materials. And some of these are, I would say, certainly made by fungi, the fungi and perhaps mycorrhizal fungi. So for example, here you've got a, you've got a tunneling structure. And I think that this can only be made by a fungus. And you see similar things um, formed under, in, this is a feldspar growing, uh, under pinus, um, where you've got an ectomycorrhizal fungi digging out, out, out tunnels. Um, you've got trenching on the surface of grains as well here, and you've got clays actually forming within the, 
within the, the trenched out structure, similar to things that, that um, people have shown in experimental situ situations growing on this case, um, a phyllosilicate. So that's a, <coughs> a, an arbuscular mycorrhizal um, fungus excavating a trench on the surface of this phyl phyllosilicate. So the way that we would like to see this go is to, is to, character, is to use um, these sorts of a combination of approaches to characterize the nature, the physical and chemical nature of the weathering under various different types of cryptogamic ground cover composition and to see if we can then use these as a, as a way of indirectly recognizing these forms of interact interactions in the geological record. Now you may tell me that I'm mad and it's impossible to do, but uh, I think that, that one, in, one has to move out of the laboratory situation and into the real world to see how these things um, work under actually gro growing, um, gro growing conditions in the wild. So I'd like to leave it at that and just um, do a little advertising that we have a, a two-day discussion meeting in the Royal Society on the Rhine and Shirt ecosystem um, coming up in March. Uh, registration is open and free, so please, I would welcome you to come along to that meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>